एस एल टी मोबिजा दी कनेक्शन एस एल टी मोबिजा दी कनेक्शन Tonight, double standards. US Secretary of State urges stern action against Sri Lanka after foreign minister's rejection of duplicitous resolution. We encourage the council to support resolutions including the lack of accountability for past atrocities in Sri Lanka. What to expect? In discussion, Foreign Secretary Jayanath Kolambagi offers insights on the UNHRC resolution fallout. Undercover operator The Easter Commission final report reveals the actual source of the foreign intelligence warning. Geoeconomics over geopolitics. Pakistan's premier calls for an end to regional conflicts and a new investment and trade focused beginning. I am optimistic that eventually sense will prevail that the only way the subcontinent can get people out of poverty is have trading relationship. All this and much more coming up on this Wednesday, the 24th of February 2021. ඇල්කොහොල් අඩංගු හෑන්ඩ් සැනිටයිසර් භාවිත කරන්න ලෙඩ රෝග ඇති කරන විෂ බීජ වලට එරෙහිව සටන් කරන්න හඳුන්වාදී මේ මිල රුපියල් 350යි From Ada Derana This is Ada Derana first at 9 live from Studio 24 in Colombo A oh, very warm welcome you're joining first at 9 on other Therana 24 we take you to tonight's top story um after foreign minister dinesh gunawardena yesterday announced the rejection of what he termed a duplicitous resolution against the sri lankan government us secretary of state today called for support for the resolution from the uh, unhrc member states as well uh, the foreign minister yesterday appealed to other member countries to lend their support to sri lanka against being victimized by a report based on hearsay and reject it outright Meanwhile the report published by the Office of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights Michelle Bachelet is yet to be taken up for consideration today. The 46th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council got underway in Geneva on Monday with 47 countries in attendance. Due to restrictions brought on by the global coronavirus pandemic this year's session will be held virtually. Addressing the 46th UNHRC session in Geneva last night, Foreign Minister Dinesh Gunawardena had strong words for who he termed hegemonic forces for their collusion in bringing about what he termed a baseless resolution against Sri Lanka. The Foreign Minister also called on member countries to show their support for Sri Lanka by rejecting any such resolution. It is regrettable that despite the spirit of cooperation with the HRC and its mechanisms elements working against Sri Lanka intend to table another country specific resolution based on the OHCHR report this rejected report by Sri Lanka has unjustifiably broadened its scope and mandate further in cooperating many issues of governance and matters that are essentially domestic in any self-respecting sovereign country i leave it to the members and observers of this council to make their own judgment on whether sri lanka represents a situation that warrants urgent attention of this council or if this is campaign is essentially a political move that contravenes the very values and principles on which this council has been established particularly at a time when legislation is enacted by some countries to protect their soldiers from prosecution in military operations carried out overseas only points to duplicity and the hypocritical nature of their motives this cannot but result in a significant loss of morale among countries engaged in the struggle against terrorism the council must hold the scales even not going by hearsay unilateral action or one angle doubtful resources but adhere to its guiding principles as the council is aware this is a critical time to the entire world in the last 100 years 
where we need to be united in our efforts to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and to revive the battered economies. I appeal to the members of this council to take note of our continued engagement and cooperation on its merit and support us by rejecting any resolution against Sri Lanka. Also addressing the session, Secretary General of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Yusuf Alotaimin raised his concerns over the cremation of Muslim victims of COVID-19. Though I see is concerned with the situation of Muslims in Sri Lanka as they are denied the right to be buried, the bodies of the virus victims following the Islamic rule while adhering to the guidelines of the World Health Organization. Though I see urge the government of Sri Lanka to take swift action to guarantee and respect the right of buried of the Muslim community. Also addressing the event, United States Secretary of the State Anthony J. Blinken encouraged the Council to support resolutions that address issues of concern around the world, including those against Sri Lanka. We encourage the Council to support resolutions at this session addressing issues of concern around the world, including ongoing human rights violations in Syria and North Korea, the lack of accountability for past atrocities in Sri Lanka, and the need for further investigation into the situation in South Sudan. The United States is fully committed to the universal protection and promotion of human rights. We look forward to working collaboratively with friends and partners in this body to ensure that the Council lives up to its mandate and effectively contributes to human rights around the world. Later this evening, Human Rights High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet's report on the human rights situation in Sri Lanka will be presented. The core group on Sri Lanka consisting of Canada, Germany, North Macedonia, Malawi, Montenegro and the United Kingdom intends to present a resolution against Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's best health insurance with the fastest claim settlement. Soft Logic Life. Pay just 500,000 rupees to reserve your unit today. Mulberry Residence. In the wake of these developments, we thought of finding out what Sri Lanka's stance is. Now, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation raised the issue of Sri Lanka's COVID-19 cremations at the 46th UNHRC sessions in Geneva yesterday, calling for the government of Sri Lanka to allow the burial of people of the Muslim faith who die of COVID-19 according to Islamic rights. The OIC comprises 57 member states. The government recently uh, backtracked on an assurance provided by the Prime Minister um, in Parliament called calling that a decision on allowing burials will depend on the recommendations of an expert committee. Uh, meanwhile, there are developments at the UNHRC where um, calls are being made to support a resolution against Sri Lanka. Uh, we thought of speaking to Admiral Jayanath Kolumbage, Sri Lanka's Foreign Secretary, to find out what kind of pressure Sri Lanka faces right now. Uh, yes, I think because I think the Foreign Minister, um, Honorable Dinesh Gunawardhan, explained very clearly the pressures that the Sri Lanka is having and also that uh, the, our determination to reject these unsubstantiated, unfounded claims against this country. I think Sri Lanka is a very peaceful country at this moment when you compare with many countries in the world. The human rights are protected here, right to life is protected here. So therefore we feel this kind of action by the Human Rights Commission is very unjust and unfair. And as the foreign minister mentioned, what we need is really the solidarity among all the countries in the world for economic revival uh, during the COVID pandemic. But on the contrary, what we get to face or what we get to spend our energy is uh, facing these unnecessary accusations coming from only a very small number of countries uh, representing the global north. So this is, of course, they, this time they have taken a small country uh, in Africa to uh, the co-sponsorship. Uh, well, that is, I think, uh, it's a bit, bit of a, a whitewash kind of a thing. Now, we have committed to be engaged with the Human Rights Commission. We have committed to be engaged with the United Nations mechanisms. We are not shying away from all the commitments that we have made. We are determined to make things happen in the country for good to find solution. And now, mm -hmm. therefore, we feel it is very unfair that we are being targeted uh, in, in an in a, uh, international body like Human Rights Council. Uh, does this also mean that the, the Sri Lankan government does not have confidence in the partiality of the UN in delivering an objective examination of facts presented by uh, the High Commissioner Michel Bachelet? 
You see, this report was prepared uh, in, in a, uh, on a desk in Geneva or somewhere. They never visited Sri Lanka. None of the rapporteurs, none of the authors visited Sri Lanka to see the situation. And today, we decided that we would extend an invitation to the High Commissioner and her team to come to Sri Lanka, to travel all over the Sri Lanka, talk to all the people in Sri Lanka, and find for themselves what they are talking about, whether anything resembling their report is there in Sri Lanka. So this is like, I mean, you know, this is last year, nobody could really travel freely, but the Human Rights Commission is in a, such a big hurry, despite all these restrictions, despite the fact that we can't even meet face to face, we have to challenge or we have to, uh, argue on a virtual platform, even mostly pre-recorded. So this is not what we need. This is not what the world need. We need to be solid. I mean, we need to unite in our efforts to overcome the economy. We need to unify our efforts to overcome the COVID-19 pandemic and not to face these unnecessarily unfounded allegations. Very quickly, what's your reaction to uh, reports that Sri Lanka may face sanctions and economic uh, embargo to, uh, uh, that could be announced against um, Sri Lanka by certain powerful member states, uh, similar to what countries such as Iran uh, have been facing? Well, you see, if there are economic sanctions against Sri Lanka, I don't think any right-minded country would do it. But suppose if somebody wants to do it, that will be against all people of Sri Lanka, not only one community, all people of Sri Lanka. And that would deter our development, that would deter our uh, COVID response progress. So if somebody is thinking of economic sanction, that they are they are doing the worst possible crime against the humanity in this country. So this the, the threat of sanction, if, you know, we, we we don't accept it. That's not right to do that. And if that is the case, it will impact all people in Sri Lanka, not only one particular group. Thank you very much, Admiral, for your time uh, here with us, joining us live on Other Dharana 24. And we take a short commercial break. We'll return with more news. Welcome back to the news. Further details of the contents of the final report of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry investigating the Easter attacks were revealed today and this time around addressing the allegations of a hidden hand behind the attacks. However, the report uh, of the Commission says that such allegations at the moment remain mere conjecture with no substantiated evidence having been presented by the witnesses who made the claims. Meanwhile, the source of the foreign intelligence warning was revealed today as an undercover Indian regional intelligence operative who maintained close links to the attackers, identified under his alias Abu Hind. Meanwhile, the final report of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry investigating the Easter Sunday attacks includes a separate chapter on testimonies provided by several witnesses alleging a foreign force behind the attacks. The allegations were made during the testimonies of the Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, former President Maitripala Sirisena, former Ministers Rauf Hakim and Richard Batyudin, former Chief of Defence Staff Ravindra Vijay Gunaratna, former Special Task Force Commandant MR Latif, former State Intelligence Service Director Nilanta Jayavardhana, and many others. However, in its report, the Commission points out that none of the witnesses had been able to provide sufficient evidence to substantiate the allegations and thus it remains only conjecture. The Commission says that based on the testimony of former Director of the State Intelligence Service, Nilanta Jayavardhana, it focused its attention on an Indian national identified as Abu Hind who was allegedly involved in the attacks. The report revealed that the former Director of State Intelligence had hinted that the suspect may have been the source of the early warning information from a foreign intelligence service. Further, the report states that Zaran Hashim's wife Hadia had revealed in her testimony that her husband and his followers had been in contact with Abu Hind since late 2017. According to a terrorism expert, Abu Hind was an undercover figure created by an Indian Provincial Intelligence Unit to monitor Indian nationals travelling to Syria for terrorist activities. The expert witness told the Commission that Abu Hind may have been informed by the terrorists, including Zaran Hashim, of their plot to carry out the attack, believing that Abu Hind was an Islamic State regional agent. The report also states that after the first series of terrorist attacks on the morning of April 21st, the State Intelligence Service received information about a vehicle carrying explosives and was able to locate the van parked near the Kochikade church. Further, the report revealed that the Criminal Investigation Department is currently investigating Abu Hind and recommends that the investigations be continued. 
Further, the Presidential Commission touches on the case of Pulasini Mahindran, alias Sarah Jasmine, the wife of the Katu Vidya Church bomber. During the recording of testimonies, two witnesses had reported that Sarah Jasmine was seen alive after the attacks. The final report of the Presidential Commission also stated that DNA analysis of samples collected at the scene of the Sindhamaradu explosion did not match with samples taken from her mother. The Presidential Commission has therefore recommended that this evidence be taken into account and further investigations be conducted into her whereabouts. Meanwhile, the report also commended Archbishop of Colombo, His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit, for what it termed his incomparable efforts at fostering reconciliation in the aftermath of the attacks, calling it an unforgettable moment in Sri Lanka's history. His appeal to all Sri Lankans to spread non-violence and compassion and to forgive their enemies prevented the further escalation of ethnic and religious disunity and prevented further devastation in the country, the Presidential Commission stated. Now visiting Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan, who left the country this evening after two-day state visit, met to President Gotabe Rajapaksa at the Presidential Secretariat this morning. The extensive talks between the two leaders focused on common interests such as trade, tourism and adoption of technology in agriculture. President Gotabe also extended an invitation to the people of Pakistan to visit Sri Lanka once the pandemic situation is brought under complete control. Prime Minister of Pakistan Imran Khan, who is in the country for a two-day state visit, met with President Gotabe Rajapaksa at the Presidential Secretariat this morning. The President's media division reports that the two leaders held extensive discussions on improving bilateral ties. During the talks, Premier Khan noted that the agricultural economy of Pakistan is similar to that of Sri Lanka and had exchanged views with President Gotabe on sharing technical knowledge. The two leaders also spoke on uplifting agriculture in ways that offer higher incomes to farmers and concessionary prices to consumers. Noting that Pakistan is a major player in Sri Lanka's export sector, the two leaders also focused on the promotion of bilateral ties and the potential of broadening investment opportunities between the two countries. During the meeting, President Gotabe extended an invitation to the people of Pakistan to visit Sri Lanka once COVID-19 is brought under control. The two leaders also expressed views on the steps needed for the betterment of the tourism industries of both countries. Now, the Pakistan-Sri Lanka Trade and Investment Conference 2021 was held in Colombo today, featuring Pakistani and Sri Lankan businessmen representatives to discuss trade and investment potential between the two countries. The summit was organized by the government of Pakistan as part of its trade engagement policy with friendly, na friendly nations. Speaking at the conference, visiting Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan called for a greater focus on resolving conflicts that remain a stumbling block to wealth creation and poverty alleviation, which he added is uh, the cornerstone of his government's policy. Speaking at the Pakistan-Sri Lanka Trade and Investment Conference 2021 today, Pakistan's Foreign Minister Makhdoom Shah Mahmood Qureshi says that the foundation for Pakistan's increased economic performance is its government's shift from geopolitics to geoeconomics. A year ago, we held a similar conference in collaboration with the Ministry of Commerce in Nairobi in line with our Engage Africa policy and it led to 7% growth in our bilateral trade in one year. So the potential, as the advisor of commerce was saying, is there. The FTA is there. We have to look at how to improve upon it, how to include new sectors into it to draw maximum benefit from it. The Prime Minister is directing us to focus on growth and that can only come through investments and enhanced bilateral trade. Incentives have been given to a number of sectors, particularly real estate and housing sector. Our focus has shifted from geopolitics to geoeconomics and our focus is peace, development, connectivity. Meanwhile, State Minister of Money, Capital Market and State Enterprise Reforms, Ajit Nimad Cabral, called on the two countries to aim for an annual trade target in the billions of US dollars instead of the current 3 to 400 million US dollars. But we have not done so well in our cooperation with regard to trade and investment. As your foreign minister just mentioned, the targets that we have set for ourselves seem to be quite low in my view. We shouldn't be looking at 300, 400 million dollars of trade and investment. We should be looking at a lot more. We should be talking about trade and investment in the billions. We all have understood that there is a resource gap 
within our countries. And that resource gap has to be filled with investment. We have been for a long time investing in the Western countries, investing in aerated countries, and we get 1% return. But when we go to borrow, we pay 7% return. At the outset itself, we have an interest differential of around 6%, which we carry right throughout. So I think we need to now think differently as to how we can cooperate with each other. Meanwhile, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan, addressing the conference, called for the subcontinent to use dialogue to resolve its issues and focus on using the wealth creation from increased trade to target mass poverty alleviation. We have completely changed our policies in Pakistan, which have sadly been there for almost 40 years, where uh, the whole government structure, the bureaucratic structure, evolved such that it was an impediment in the way of investment and, and the business community. The third thing you need to create wealth in any country is political stability. Having good relationship with your neighbors. Immediately when I came into power, I um, explained to Prime Minister Modi that the way forward for the subcontinent is for us to resolve our differences through dialogue. I didn't succeed, but I'm optimistic that eventually sense will prevail that the only way we in the subcontinent can get people out of poverty is have trading relationship. We have a relationship that has huge potential for both the country. From Pakistan point of view, I think the most we can learn from Sri Lanka is in tourism because you have a much more advanced tourism industry compared to us. Finally, I would like to ask the business community in Sri Lanka to participate in our CPEC project. CPEC is, a, is an initiative of the BRI, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, and it opens the opportunity of Sri Lankan businesses right up to Central Asia. It gives you an opportunity of connecting from Gwadar, which is the port, right up to um, Uzbekistan and the Central Asian states. Is there truth behind reports that Sri Lanka faces a dearth of vaccines? We'll find out once we return after this break. Welcome back to the news. In the face of public concerns regarding a possible dearth of vaccines to cover the current program, Deputy Director General of Health Services Dr. Hemant Taherat stated that there is no shortage of vaccine at the moment. He revealed that Sri Lanka is yet to receive its next consignment of 500,000 COVID-19 vaccines from the Serum Institute of India tomorrow night. The total number of COVID-19 infections detected yesterday amounted to 492, with all of them locally identified cases. The infections were reported across 21 districts in the island, with Colombo once again reporting the highest of 103 cases. Further, 88 infections were also detected from the Gampaha, 53 from the Ampara, 48 from the Nurelia, 32 from the Jaffna, 29 from the Kandy and 24 from the Mulatiu districts. The remaining 113 infections were detected from 14 other districts. Meanwhile, Deputy Director General of Health Services Dr. Hemant Herat explained the reason for higher cases being detected through increased PCR tests. At this moment, the testing is done predominantly on contact tracing. Therefore, whenever we get large number of cases, we have to test large number of contacts. And when the numbers of cases detected are high, the number of tests will be done among these contacts also will go up. And relatively high number of cases also will be, wherever we do the random sampling, the percentage or total number of cases detected is not increasing compared to the number of tests done in those places. In the meantime, according to data on the website of the Epidemiology Unit, four more COVID-19 fatalities have been confirmed during the day, increasing the total to 457. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka is to receive its next consignment of 500,000 COVID-19 vaccines from India's Serum Institute tomorrow night. With that, Deputy Director General of Public Health Services Dr. Hemant Herath rejected rumours of a shortage of vaccines in the country. There is a notion going on that the vaccines are not available, all stocks are diminishing. We have over 100,000 doses available and we are expecting another 500,000 doses by tomorrow as the Ministry of Health has purchased these items and therefore there is no major issue of diminishing stocks. 
Meanwhile, 12,555 people considered among priority groups were vaccinated under the National Vaccination Program yesterday, bringing the total number of vaccinations so far to 366,907. With that, vaccinations of priority groups worked off today as well at several vaccination points in Colombo. As things stand, the total number of recoveries from COVID-19 in Sri Lanka increased to 76,514, with 672 patients having recovered and discharged during the day. The central bank has issued a statement in response to media statements that argue that recent rules on the repatriation of export proceeds into the country and their conversion into Sri Lankan rupees discourage Sri Lankan exporters from expanding their domestic businesses. The media reports also implied that the legitimate earnings of exporters were being usurped by the banking system and the government. In response, the central bank of Sri Lanka stated that the rules were issued in order to strengthen the foreign exchange situation of the country and to dampen speculative activity that caused some excessive volatility in the exchange rate. In its clarification, the central bank said that many Sri Lankan exporters have already repatriated a large share of their foreign exchange earnings into Sri Lanka. Further, it adds that exporters have also converted a substantial portion of their foreign exchange earnings to rupees in order to meet their domestic payment obligations. The central bank also said that such repatriation and conversion requirements are not uncommon in other regional economies and are in fact more stringent in other countries. Colombo stocks gain 0.5% today with index heavy counters pushing the ASPI up to recover some losses from yesterday's drop. The all share price index gained 42.65 to close at 7,371, while the more liquid SP SL20 index gained 0.02. Here's a brief report on how markets performed today. Today we can identify the market as being on a stabilization phase. Overall the downtrend has been continuing with on and off a couple of days we are seeing positive signs. Today we saw the market gaining around 42 points which shows that the day was a lot more positive than the usual. Today the turnover levels were about 2.6 billion rupees below the 3 billion mark as well. So despite the market Having this uh, retail uh, momentum still present in it, the retail activity in the market has significantly declined. Also on the news tonight, Minister of Power Dallas Alha Peruma says that Sri Lanka has not yet arrived at a final decision on the granting of hybrid power projects in the Delft Islands to a Chinese company as the Treasury has requested information on the new technology that is to be used. Metana me dupatune, Danata, Mulitiase Purama, diesel generator will in Tamai, Simitavala, Viduledin. Sapemarate Sahodra Purvasio, me Tina Sangdan and Yojanek and Makasodra Manduru Danuati, Itama Dukita, Jivita Katakarani. Sam Metan the Vidule Labadima Jatika Vasatavia, Paranicarne. Devinicarne, make a Aurdu Pahaktisig, Asiano Sangwadana Bankue, Mulla Dara Yatate, me Pilibandava, Jatiantra Tendra Kendua. Make at a Asian song at the Bank of Madihatela, Unga, Dixon Yatate, Palavinimata, Tender Kandewa. There are eight tender Kandavi, Medi, Dripati, Silu, Parsevian, Asartaka Parsha and Barbatino. Then never the Didas Dahaname, Juli Masse, Devini Tender Kandavano. There are make it a Athena Hatrak Dripatino, Athena Hatrang Ekak Chine, O Ekak India. There are make it a tender.
टेंडर मंडले अभी सीन डॉलर मिलियन दोला हक ये नाडुमल आंसू थी बिच्छा के लकी है ना ये समागम टा मेकअप देनो आ ये टेंडर क्या पटिपाती किसी में वरदान पहला ने है भाई कैबिनेट मंडले आ तावो में मेकअप अनुमत करें ना मुकदर महाबांडा कार्य अभी सीन उनके वैदी मनात निर्देश नहीं � मैं पिल बंदा वो उनके पत्तिंग यम मैं का ग्रांट का विधियाँ टा मैं मुदल देन्ना यारा उड़ान दुनिया के लक किल दिया President's Council Salia Pires has been appointed as the 26th President of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. President's Council Salia Pires became the Bar Association's 26th President, winning with a clear majority over his rival candidate, President's Council Kuvera Di Soiza. Pires polled 5,093 votes, while Kuvera Di Soiza polled 2,707 votes. With that, Pires was declared the winner with a majority of 2,386 votes. The polling, which commenced yesterday, was held at 85 centres throughout the island, with 17,000 attorneys at law eligible to cast their votes. Solicitor General Sanjay Rajaratnam functioned as the election's returning officer. This is not my victory alone, but the victory of the bar, a victory for a strong and an independent bar. And once again, the bar has shown that it votes wisely and that the bar can take principal decisions based on policies. Be involved in the work of the bar. I will be someone who will be open. I will be a president who will be accessible to the members of the bar. And in the next few weeks, I will plan what we have to do. And I would like to see our policies, our program of action be actually implemented and to see how we can make that a success. That's all for tonight. Thank you for watching. Good night.